So I'm going to give a, a very different kind of talk. First of all, I'm not an economist, um, but <laughs> I know I snuck in here. <laughs> but second of all, um, so Andrew and I have been thinking about this, like what is our fantasy world? What, are we, what could we do if, if the sky were the limit? <laughs> yeah, I know, no, no, fair enough, fair enough. Um, <laughs> what could we do in data collection if, sky, if the sky is the limit? Um, and so I'm going to present uh, sort of two things. The first is an idea about um, how would you build the next generation of early warning systems um, in education. Um, and then the second is going to be uh, what sort of what is the data, our data wish list, and how would we gather that kind of data um, given the technology that currently exists um, or might exist in the near future. Um, okay. So since I'm actually a biologist by training, the example I sort of wanted to think about in terms of early warning systems um, is, is comes from medicine, but maybe you guys are familiar with it. Um, so there's a sort of a, been a huge push at the national level to prevent diabetes. And so in the United States, there's something called the Diabetes Prevention Program, was sanctioned by the NIH. Um, and if you meet the criteria, you can participate in this program, which helps to helps uh, people to change their eating habits and their exercise habits in the hopes of pre preventing them from turning from pre-diabetic to diabetic. Um, and you can imagine that this is actually, this is super important because the savings you can get from preventing diabetes is enormous. And so getting in there early um, and preventing it uh, makes a huge economic difference, makes a huge health difference. Um, but it relies on knowing what the early warning signs are and what the, um, the points of intervention are. Right? It's, it's only because we know a ton about what, um, what biological factors precede diabetes and where we can intervene to prevent diabetes that makes it possible to um, pe prevent people from converting from prediabetes to diabetes. Uh, so now I want to argue, uh, there are early warning systems in education, um, but I want to argue that they're actually not quite the right systems. Um, so most of them, there are 52% of US high schools have such a system to look for, to um, try and estimate risk for kids dropping out. Um, but they are predominantly correlates of attendance, misbehavior, and course performance. And the problem is that those are really good for detecting failures. By the time a kid is um, doing really poorly in school, is missing a large number of days, right? In, in order for them to get to the place where you see that there's really a problem in any of those things, um, they're pretty far down the road. It's actually pretty hard, right? They're, they're much worse than, um, than you know, pre-diabetic. They're sort of, they're in this place where it's getting harder and harder to rescue them, and the amount of resources that's required um, is much greater. You're actually much closer to failure, essentially, than to prevention. Um, the other problem is that much of this data is actually a low temporal resolution, so typically you're getting course reports once a semester. Maybe if the kids are sort of like under high scrutiny, you're seeing more, more grades um, on a more granular level, but typically this is going on at the sort of marking period level for most kids, unless, again, they're sort of very close to failure. Um, and so I want to argue that um, these are sort of the wrong, the wrong ways to model how you would, do, how you would find early warnings. Um, we know that there are actually a whole host of other predictors of dropout. Um, uh, we know that uh, on high school outcomes, we know that physical health and mental health, um, social connectedness, peer group influences, parental involvement, housing and stability, interactions with the criminal justice system, psychological traits, or, like there are many, many reasons why kids have trouble completing high school and they are different for different kids. Um, and they are different across the time scale. So a kid might start with, um, you know, sort of a social connectedness problem, and that turns into a mental health problem um, because they become depressed. So, um, so understanding sort of the temporal dynamics um, for a wide range of influences is going to be really important for developing the kinds of models that you would need in order to detect kids at the place where you could intervene. Um, so here I want to sort of suggest um, an example of what could be a next generation model if you had the ideal data set. <laughs> um, and I, I'm going to, I just, we picked, I picked sort of four things um, that we know are pretty strong predictors. Um, so mental health, particularly in high school, this is a time when uh, many of the mental health uh, challenges arise for kids. Um, some earlier, but for many kids, not until high school. Um, social connectedness is, is super important. Um, physical health, you know, asthma, is particularly in New York City, but in many places, asthma is something, um, is a, a pretty serious problem and um, causes 
problems with attendance, for example, right? If, you're, um, if you are in the hospital and if you go to the emergency room to get treatment, you don't make it to school the next day, or if you are too sick to make it to school, right? So um, it's true that many of those things will lead to the, the ABCs, um, but these are what we think are probably the, the more root causes. And so the idea is can we, can we use all of these things um, to identify earlier uh, what the problems are? Um, so here's an example uh, of, a, you know, this is, again, this is totally not real. This is hypothetical data. And so you can imagine here's a kid who sort of seems to be doing well. They start the school off. They're doing pretty well. Um, and this is a sort of standard model. Um, and suddenly around April, um, their behavior and their grades begin to drop. Um, and suddenly they're on the other side of the risk zone. Um, but you can imagine that if you had been looking at a bunch of other stuff, you might have seen what was going on much, much earlier before they started to you know, get suspended or um, be in danger of not passing you know, of that, that school year. Um, what if it was really a problem um, of, of social connectedness <coughs> and mental health that happened sometime in the fall? And could, if we had been able to spot that, we might have been able to intervene at an earlier point before they were essentially failing. Um, and so again, there's sort of, the idea here is you could have one model, but many root causes. And so for each, for each kid, it may be different. Um, here's a kid who sort of started to show trouble in attendance and in grades somewhere around April also, you know, sort of toward the end of the year, but earlier, um, you know, also had sort of a falling out with peers and decided that school was not, not where they wanted to spend their effort. It's also, it's also just a very deep thing because the fact that you're not noticed in a timely fashion is a major problem. Mm -hmm. Because you like to be recognized, and one of the first things that you said, does anybody actually notice mm -hmm. that I have slipped off? And you do. You know what you're doing. And, and nobody's, so it's very isolated not, not to have a response. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so again, these are all sort of variations on the theme that, um, you know, you start, here's one, you start hanging out with the wrong kids, or, um, you know, maybe, maybe you, your identity becomes part of the, uh, the burnout group, um, and suddenly, you know, um, that leads to some mental health issues, and, um, and again, you know, if you think about what the, the, the ABC model looks like, it's going to be a while before you get noticed. Um, and again, this is sort of a third example. Um, so again, I sort of, I just want to sort of, I'm pointing out here that there are a lot of things that we might care deeply about that are much harder to measure <laughs> than absences and school behavior and grades, um, but that they might be incredibly valuable. Um, so we do have um, new ways to monitor these kinds of indicators. Um, so for example, we can passively monitor, right? This doesn't require much, anything on the part of high school kids. Almost all high school kids these days are carrying a phone in their pocket. And so if we could gather data from them in a way that's um, pretty uh, burdenless, frictionless, um, that will, will go a long way towards being able to track some of these things. You can actually do the launch from this way. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, so are you thinking of this at the population level? That's what your, mo your idea here is. Yes, so it is. you think you could do this for like every kid in every school, so you could use this to identify risk of dropping out at so, age 17. So um, I think this is... Yes, a, that's the idea. A, but I think, I think it's, uh, that, is the, uh, that is the general idea, but I think there's okay, some I, new... I'm I, just trying to fix ideas here. Don't yeah, yeah. Know. I mean, I think there's going to be... I have seen this movie. <laughs> Um, I think that there's, I think there's, um, there are a couple of things that may be, um, you have to, that could, different ways you could implement this, for sure, right? So one thing is that in different schools it may be different, right? That it is my understanding, I, this is not my area of expertise, uh, the this model, the early warning models is not my area of expertise, I, I will totally put that on the table. My understanding is that the early, early warning models in different schools are different, there's sort of, there's a movement, and I don't know whether that reflects the fact that the data is not great, <laughs> and so the models actually don't really reflect the true sort of early warning signals, um, or whether that's because places are really different. I think the idea is that you, if if this were really true, then you wouldn't need to. Um, you could 
you could have a set of schools or a set of kids drawn from a bunch of schools in the city and you could build the model using um, a representative sample and then any, um, any kid who you were particularly worried about, for example, or um, so parents could opt in or, I mean, I can sort of imagine that you could do it differently. But yes, the general idea is. Good, good. good. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, geographical patterns. Um, so where are people going, right? So you actually, um, it may be that kids are not absent, but they leave, they cut school early. They don't come back from lunch or they, right? And a lot of that is not particularly well tracked in schools. And so there may be um, information. Or maybe after school kids are hanging out in not such great places. Um, are kids going, this is a, a way of, a passive way of actually getting at some of the housing instability, right? Um, you will be able to see pretty quickly if kids are spending their, their evenings in the same place every night. Are they going home after school? Are they going to the library after school? Are they um, couch surfing with different family members? All of this is stuff that um, is, could be difficult to collect, but actually um, from the geographical tracks, you may be able to get some pretty interesting information without having to burden the kids at all. Um, communication patterns are clearly pretty important for understanding what the sort of peer group situation is, but also for understanding um, relationships between parents and children. Um, these days many kids are texting their parents and um, so there's a way of capturing essentially sort of some of that information as well. Um, and finally, social media usage for many kids is, um, can be interesting. There's some work suggesting that um, social media usage changes as um, at the onset of, or sort of just before the onset of a mental health crisis. And so if you see that kids are sort of beginning to withdraw from their social networks, that may also be a signal that there, there it may be time for an intervention. Um, there's also a lot of active monitoring you could do if you could get compliance from kids. Um, I think there's, there's some work to suggest that kids would, would participate, particularly with some of the stuff I'll talk about um, afterwards, about how you could engage them. Um, and so then there are, there are plenty of stuff that um, might give you information about sort of their mental health <coughs> and about other, um, about their, medic their medical situation, stuff like that. Um, and finally, and this is totally for Andrew, right? Um, <laughs> in home air quality, so for kids who have asthma, right, if you know that um, there's a lot of smoking going on in the home, right, that's a place where you might, you could actually, you could intervene. It would be difficult. I do not argue that telling mom that her boyfriend can't smoke in the house wouldn't be a difficult thing, but um, maybe you might encourage the kid to stay with grandma. I mean, there are ways in which we could, if we only knew that information, um, we might be able to make suggestions um, about making choices, right? That kids can make choices, parents can make choices, but if they're not even necessarily so aware of um, what those choices might be. It's especially important in things like air quality where it's fundamentally invisible. Often, you may not know that actually, you know, kind of by not putting an air conditioner in a room, you so happen to be near the highway and, you know, you're poisoning your kid. Like, that's not something people want to do. Um, yeah, and I think um, another sort of piece of the puzzle is about, um, again, these are ways of, I think, tracking some of the information about what's going on in people's lives without burdening them. So um, government benefits information or electronic health records are a way of getting at some of the um, things that are making life more, more challenging for kids um, and trying to figure out if there's a way to, to help to intervene there as well. Um, suppose we were to have the ideal data set, okay? Then we also need the ideal government with the <laughs> ideal funding to do the interventions. I was wondering, literally, what would an intervention look like? And is there, and what would the government responsi the agency responsibility be once they have this ideal data set? Is that part of what we should be thinking about? Well, I, 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 let me put it this way. This isn't coming because people will raise objections before no, it no, gets I a get chance it. I get that, but to be implemented. Right. So I think I'd rather first, I mean, it's worth taking the opposite viewpoint briefly. Okay. Which <laughs> is, suppose okay. that we could, and fundamentally the way this will come in is to upper middle class parents. This is going to happen. Okay, so who's actually going to do it? Uh, and it's going to come in to upper, so it's always the way something happens. 
it happened. It's like, well, no, you can't do this. Well, no, you can't ban me. I can buy it. So people will buy it. You'll find people buying services that are informative to them about how they, oh, about their own going. children. I see where you're going, yeah. And it then turns out that, well, it's, it's a sin not to allow it to trickle down. So what else should be in this, right? What about their I tax see. records? Yes. Is that the next? You know, why are we not getting... Well, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to... I'm gonna. Uh, can I finish this and then I'm going to talk about what does the ideal data set look like? Oh, I thought that's what was the other thing. No, no. no yeah, so I'm going to... I was going to get to that. I have one more slide. Oh, you mean there's more than what you have there. I thought that was... This is like... Um, this, was a, this was a toy example. What if I took sort of four things that I think are really oh, important? Okay, so yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, it's not... Look, like, even in our, like, ideal world, there... <laughs> Um, so, I, so I just want to say, I, I wanted to give one example because I think a lot of people are, um, you know, how do you turn something like GeoTrax into, um, into data that could be used for an early warning system? And so I just wanted to sort of think about, um, just to give you guys a sense, because I thought I should have an equation. Um, <laughs> that's it. That's all, that's all you're going to see. Um, sort of one idea, sort of as you, um, you see people traveling, and so you can learn an enormous amount um, about their patterns. Most people actually travel sort of the same routes um, on a pretty repeated basis. Most kids, most high school kids, if you look at them, are gonna go, they leave home in the morning, they go to school, they go somewhere else in the afternoon perhaps, um, and then they come home at night. Um, and they, um, and so seeing these patterns, but you may see changes in these patterns. So one thing is to look at, you can do pattern detection, you can look for changes. Um, that sort of, uh, that requires no, um, assumptions about what it is that's changing, only that you're sort of interested in whether there are changes, and that might indicate um, a change in the routine may indicate a change in something else. Um, they stop, you know, you'll see they stop going to school, or you see that they start um, hanging out with a different crowd after school, whatever, whatever that is. Um, or you can think about um, extracting features like um, uh, whether they're using different modes of transportation, or you know, these are also sort of higher order questions. Isn't, it, isn't there a famous study of you know, kind of study the speed and what what's the onset of flu? <laughs> <laughs> I think they've done that. You mean you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I think these are this is sort of like one one particular data set that's pretty rich, um, and you could think about how you might use it. Um, to interrogate how kids' lives are changing and whether um, those changes uh, predict something, um, something bad happening. Um, okay. So the now, this is it. This is like the big long list of everything that Andrew and I could think of um, that we might want to measure. And you guys probably have even more things that you would measure. Um, and so uh, I put here as an example sort of um, the list of things that many studies have today, right, are sort of um, genomes, um, billing codes for health insurance, some electronic medical records, some, you know, sort of blood chemistry and um, lab tests that people may have had done in their, in their history. Um, you know, these days people are using Fitbits more and more. Um, there's, of course, administrative data like the, the ACS, and then there's also um, uh, sort of some wealth and credit. So people are beginning to use some of that um, financial information. Um, but, and that's like, even that is a lot, right? But I want to make the argument that there's actually a ton of things that we could be collecting that might give us some um, insight into um, people's lives. And some of these will be easier to collect than others, for sure, right? I think um, the criminal justice stuff is something I think is so, so interesting, but very hard to get a handle on, right? I think kids' lives are, many kids in, in um, in New York City, for sure, and in um, challenged populations, are really strongly influenced by police and court court interactions that are not on the record, right? Like how many plea, whether people plea, whether um, they get picked up by the police and released, um, all of that kind of stuff. So I think some of the stuff is really below the threshold for what's easy to collect. But I I, I want to argue that um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. <laughs> um, I don't know. This is a very long list. But I, and I don't know if there's things that people wish that um, p wish that we would have. So here I actually don't have much about um, social, you know, um, peer interactions specifically, right? Some of that falls into the the um, social stuff, sort of how much time people are spending with their families, um, how much uh, sort of social media or phone usage people have. Um, but I ha we hadn't thought about the like photographs of the lunchroom. Um, or the, you know, sort of one of the things you can do with Bluetooth is that um, if people are carrying phones in their pockets, you actually can see whether people are um, 
repeatedly with the same people <coughs> over time. Because um, there are sort of signals, there are, uh, the phones have addresses essentially, and so if you're looking, you can actually see whether you see the same addresses over time um, in, in people's close proximity. So there are a lot of technological tools that are um, available. They're actually currently available that may not be available in the future. So because there's a lot of concern about privacy, for example, um, Apple is sort of moving in the direction of hiding those addresses. So if um, two people who have iPhones sit next to each other um, today, the addresses will actually be shuff will be um, scrambled so that the next time they're sitting next to each other, actually those addresses will be different. Um, the externally visible addresses will be different. Um, and so one of the things sort of in the future is trying to think about how to, um, how to work with <laughs> the technology, which is ever changing, um, to develop um, tools that will work um, universally. Um, so I think that's sort of the, now I was going to talk a little bit about tool development, um, which is now like completely out there for most people. So if this is like, <laughs> oh, sorry. yeah, before I change, oh, I mean, yeah, I yeah. We can talk about this later. Okay, so I think of this as like, like okay, that's like a cool list. There's probably a thousand other things you could have put on mm -hmm. the list that aren't, you know, like why weight and not height? I don't know. I think it's a little hard to know what to make of your weight if you don't know how tall you are, but still. And so I look at this and I think uh, there's a set of these things that are already, you know, data that's gathered for administrative purposes. Mm -hmm or either for yourself or for someone else. And that's a question of putting records together. Mm -hmm. But then there's a set of these things that are really sensitive, really troubling, really out there. And I wonder, you know, if there's, you know, if you had done the, the thinking of hierarchically, like, you know, what do you think is gettable, easy, you know, worth mm -hmm. getting with high value? Mm -hmm. You know, what's like your next bunch? Because I, I, you know, and then what's sort of the someday aspirational? And, I, and, and the reason I think that's so important is you put them all together, and I think it's really easy to say this is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. do, you know, do you know what I mean? Sure. Thing, so yeah. that's what I'm not sure about. Like, drug consumption? You know, go you. Uh, <laughs> you know, you want to ask a bunch of teenagers what what drugs they're taking? Yeah. Can I follow yeah, that? Yeah. I think the thing that you might hear is something to think about is where the where the information resides in the system. And then ask questions of the form of, uh, of revelation. So let me give you an example. Um, people think teacher quality is very important, and of course, there's a distinct literature, how do you measure value added and all of that. And I've always found that a curious literature since actually I think knowledge of teacher quality is easy because it's residing in a certain population called the parents. And so the question, and, the, and that's the way I would think about the data acquisition. In other words, you start off by asking, where does the information live in the system? Then who has access to it? And then how would you somehow get that, uh, extract that information? And so I think that's another layer to put on top of this because that begins to address the issues of, uh, of feasibility. I, I, I want to just make a point that um, that uh, this is not totally abstract, uh, neither is it implemented. Uh, it's not totally abstract in the sense that, uh, that we were quite far down the road, uh, which is now currently a little bit stopped up. Uh, you know, that, that we're currently kind of in a, in a holding pattern, developing uh, a data set designed largely not around children <coughs> per se, but around the life cycle with all of these issues and with an awareness that we could take on such things as pollution very quickly. So you take on what's going on in the environment and you imagine like, wait a second, we now monitor the physical environment for toxins, although not very well. We are now increasingly aware that there are a thousand toxins that are really quite dangerous and that we haven't even measured them enough to know the effects they're having. And you can make a very, very clear use case that and you can take five different conditions, and they tend to be medical ones to start with. And you know what? I mean, they're insoluble without this enriched data, and they're potentially soluble with. And so that's how we kind of made a case, and it was a successful case 
with, the, with members of the public who would be willing to participate. So we already have te tested that out. Why would they be willing to participate? Because you can name the problems that, you, that, that are going on in their community that they feel that you're helping to resolve. So I'm saying, saying this is, if you take the viewpoint of what we do now is great and don't interfere with it, then why are people dying? So, so no, that's so, not the so, view. I think the question is, you know, some of these are, are again, I, I was sort of thinking we're giving you, oh, you okay. the and, of Yeah, this is, I just, this is totally agnostic about where it comes from or how do we hope to understand it. I mean, I think um, uh, what is, um, if you wanted to understand health, right, even just in health, sort of knowing what the, um, the billing code, the insurance billing codes are, is different from having the electronic medical records, which is also different from asking people um, whether their health is interfering with their ability to do activities of daily living, right? Those are sort of three different perspectives on a person's health. And so I think also a piece of this is trying to understand what data, I agree, what data is accessible, what data can we get, what data is, turns out to be useful. I mean, some of this is a little bit exploratory. I don't really know which of those three things is gonna turn out to be the most, um, uh, the best predictor of whether, ki whether um, physical health forces a kid to drop out of school, right? So some of it is actually, in building those models, we need to, we don't actually know yet which are the best predictors. And so some of that, we, we'll, we presumably wouldn't need to collect all data, um, but I think I don't yet know enough about um, what, what things are predictive to, to decide a priori um, which things I should be collecting. So, and if I collect the wrong data, I might, I might my models may not be as good or may, might lead me in the wrong direction. I think there's some danger there. We're also getting partly tactical advice on what not to say. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> about we will be drug testing you and uh, report to the police for your problem. Um, okay. So I think sort of this goes to this point of the, that list is totally agnostic. There's lots of different ways in which you can gather some of these things you can get from traditional medical measurements, you can get um, existing third party data, whether that's um, records from schools, whether that's um, uh, health records, externally available health records or financial records. Um, and then you can also um, develop, you can use portable technology, right? This is an instrumented smart home technology. And um, except for sort of the surveys and stuff that I might send you, all of this data requires no effort on your part. This is data that you've already shed into the environment in one way or another. And so the idea is um, we could just gather that up from the ground, essentially. It's you know, sort of flowing out already and put it together to, to be able to do some of the modeling we'd like to do. Um, this is just a different way of thinking about it. And I, um, I just, I'm not gonna talk about any of these, some, unless people are interested. These are sort of some of the kinds of technologies that currently exist to gather data passively, um, whether that's Andrew's favorite um, in-home air quality or whether that's um, using Bluetooth location beacons. So we, uh, the story I always used to tell was um, we, use, we give out surveys about whether you eat, di eat dinner with your kids, whether families eat dinner together. And there's a lot of demand effect there, right? People know now at this point that you should be saying yes. Um, but one way you could actually test that um, directly is to put a Bluetooth beacon underneath the dining room table or the place where people typically gather in any particular apartment um, and you can actually look to see whether people, how often do you see actually people gathered around that location. I know you're like horrified by this. Yeah, I'm totally horrified, but you know, I'm <laughs> like, why don't you just, uh, you know, you can send those drone cameras around <laughs> and take pictures. Uh, no joke, we had a colleague here at NYU who talk about how you have the drone cameras and they'll go and they'll take pictures and buy them. Like, why not? That's another way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going to sort of, uh, I'm going to sort of go in the opposite direction, which is sometimes we have much more data than you put on your list. So for instance, we use canvas. Um, we use what? Canvas for, canvas. yeah, uh, for, um, you know, maybe you guys use Blackboard. So there's several dominant, you know, platforms for us to post grades and syllabus and stuff like that. The thing with these systems, is, so at Michigan, 99% of the students are in the system. We know when they, you know, when the assignment, when they, when, when's the first time they download the assignment? When did they submit to it for the first time? How many times they try? For instance, lots of instructors says, you can submit as many as possible, or you can submit up to 10. 
assignments and will take the latest one. And um, so you have all that behavior data. And we just did a study of a, about a thousand undergrads and we let them play a battery of games. And so this is sort of the new machine learning approach for prediction, mm -hmm. um, trying to predict the GPA. Um, and so they, they did a battery of games and they also completed some survey questions. And it turns out that, you know, the most predictive factor is, you know, you're procrastinating. <laughs> um, so if people say, yeah, I tend to procrastinate, and that turns out to be better predictive of their GPA, then we can go into the campus data and see, you know, the homework is due in a week. When's the first time you download the homework? So you have behavioral validation <laughs> of whether people's perception is actually correct. And so, um, and, and that's going to trickle down to, I think, middle school as well, middle school and high school. Um, you know, in our public schools actually have this power school, so this is related to your, right, you sort of know, the, the software That's where I can check the multiple the times a day to see this. how yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm a huge, I'm, I guess I would say I'm a huge fan of um, like this stuff is already going on as you point out like you know the university is doing stuff like this um, Google is clearly doing lots of stuff like this and so I guess my argument is like why shouldn't we like we who are thinking about how could we develop better interventions how could we make the world a better place like why shouldn't we also be using these tools I mean I, um, is it I, I think the privacy door like the door to that barn is um, is long open and so um, we're not arguing for something I think diff quantitative, qu qualitatively different from what's sort of already happening. Yeah. And, and the teachers also know um, how often the parents check how Oh, really? Yeah, they know <laughs> how many times you log in. Uh, and so the teachers in principle can say, well, this child's parent never actually check log into our school. That is true. That, so those data sets are increasingly available and they are, uh, and they're very, they could be. <laughs> Until you start using it for something, and then what we know is people then know that and they respond. Conceivable, but in the meantime, very useful. No, exactly. The question is, do you know? Do we know when? Right. I mean, I, I think that's just mm -hmm. an important thing we know about data. Right. You collect it until you use it for something, for control or prediction, and then the meaning changes. Right. So if you know that your professor is going to form an opinion upon about right. you based on when you first download the assignment, everyone's downloading it no, right I, away. I, I'm not saying that's what you're proposing, but no, I'm saying no. if you did go that next step, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you want to actually go a step further, which oh, is the first day of school you say, okay. you know, in the past, yeah. we see the students who download I'm gonna, I'm, I'm right gonna, away and start early. I think I'm not going to talk about the next So that's what should, everybody should do. No, that's lovely. Yeah. That's totally yeah. lovely. You tell people that. But if you say, and I'm going to be looking to see who's downloading that uh, right away, everybody will download it right away. And then the. Listen, the I, I, I could follow, yeah. follow the moves down five steps, and I can yeah. tell you what my daughter would do. I, I know exactly how yeah. she would, exactly how And then some kid's going to write not. some app that just downloads them all for everybody's thing yeah. right yeah. away yeah. at Caltech, so right? <laughs> That's easy, but the next step is so you've downloaded it, you've got to have done question one vaguely competently, and that's we're, now we're finished. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a harvesting. So I'm like I'm totally out of time, so I'm not gonna go through all this. I, I did have one this is sort of like the things you could do. Um, and I wanted to talk about engage I, I want to talk about identity only because it sort of came up in the previous talk, um, about the idea that uh, that the one of the things that keeps people engaged in filling out stuff and doing things um, if you want to sort of keep people over the long haul is identity um, and it's about sort of cultivating an identity that people are part of something they choose to be part of a study because they for whatever their personal reason is maybe it's because they want to find cures for diseases or you know improve um, improve schooling for other kids um, or for parents for other families um, because they want to make the world a better place um, and so um, 
the, what makes people actually stay in studies like this is actually connecting with their identity. So it's both about sort of creating, um, we use video game avatars essentially um, inside of the, the app we have. And it's really important that you can customize your avatar to look like anything. You can look like who you are or you can look like somebody different. Um, but, you, uh, but you control sort of your physical um, instantiation inside the game. Um, and then the app itself sort of tries to give you rewards and create um, a virtual world in which you're reinforcing the fact that they are participating in something because of who they are and because of what they, what they, why they joined, what they want to be a part of. Um, so that's all, I, I just want to sort of connect that to the previous thing that there are, there's a lot of work th um, in the video game world thinking about um, how people construct identities and how to use that, um, those constructed identities um, as well to sort of keep people engaged. So th with that, I will stop so that we're not like hours over. Thank you. All right, so I'm a uh, self-defined economic data engineer, uh, and uh, that means that I think about ideal data, and I think that's the biggest, by far, uh, the thing that interests me the most, is how would you ideally gather data? You've seen uh, Hannah present some of the less theoretically guided, because I believe in the end, a lot of the engine data we're going to engineer is because technology lets us. Uh, and we'll be doing much more like what, you know, instruments that will help us develop new fields because the instruments exist and what used to be invisible is visible. And that's amazing. Uh, but I'm going to take a viewpoint uh, through theory. Uh, yes, I'm a total believer in the, in the idea theory is needed, and I believe our field uh, and social science is largely about counterfactuals. So, and I know kind of this is the big deal is like I'd like to change something, and I'd like to predict how, how the world would respond to a particular change. And we have this wonderful, wonderful modeling tradition in economics, which ideally allows us to answer policy questions and answer all contingent questions. It's an amazing tradition. Um, but I think our social science, the problem in social science is that we have a thousand latent variables per data type. I can invent, you know, it's not just your individual preference, it's your preference evolves over time, your beliefs are f and your identity, oh, and, 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 your, and your psychological characteristics. And Wisdom, unfortunately, is often, you know, you think it's simple, I'll double up the number of, pro you know, the number of invisible features of a person that are explaining their behavior, and then all you say, all you get in the data is that they then chose the apple over the orange. And it's kind of disappointing, like, really? You think I'm, I'm going to get all those thousand characteristics from the apple out over the orange? And so we're not doing quite enough to kind of dream up um, uh, data types. And I'm going to be very specific and kind of dull about it. Let's think about um, school choice mechanisms. I mean, you know these kind of really well. Here's the, uh, and I'm going to talk about three things I think we need to measure at least, at least, at least. I'd add for a fourth. I like identity a lot, and I don't. I didn't put much of it here, but clearly, we need to, you know, go beyond this. I don't even know that identity fits within this. It might be a fourth group. So I don't know quite how to think about that. But knowledge. There is something about what best information apply, implies about, say, what a school is. So look, we know what a school is. We know who the teacher is. We know lots of things as the outside observers that we'd call the knowledge about the system. <laughs> that might be quite different than the subjective beliefs about those things that are guiding choices. I have no idea because they're invisible. And what about the preferences? They're invisible too. People don't reveal to me all their likes and dislikes. And my ground rules are that we've just gathered Hannah's data set. I'm, I'm going to take it that we've done everything we can to measure everything that's visible in the entire universe. And now I'm going to worry about the latent variables. Uh, so I'm going to basic propose, I, I'm really going to focus actually on rather tedious things, which is surveys. 
Uh, this relates a little bit to what Steve said. You've got to go for where the information is. There's a lot of buried information in people's heads that we haven't dug out appropriately. And I believe we could do a great deal better job of understanding what is sought and what is achieved and, what, and, and the failure if we just ask. And I would propose that a very minimal condition for getting education right in the next period is that we ask better questions. There's a lot of people with a lot of buried information. Uh, and you're going to get me, I'm going to end on a mild rant. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to propose that you talk to not only the children, but also the parents. Uh, and ask them a few questions because uh, they got things to say. <laughs> like, um, okay. And I'm going to, the paper I'm starting out with is Justin Elian Mansky, and it's a very, it's an economic inquiry, uh, and it uh, talks about the following issue. Like, people pick schools in matching mechanisms. Matching mechanisms are modeled as reflecting perfectly the preferences of the applicants over schools. Not over subjective schools, over objective schools. That's the model. Oh, then life's easy, okay? So we, everybody puts their list in. They put in their preferences over which school they like. So now, actually, we could redesign schools. And we're finished. If we just want to meet people's goals, it's easy. We now un we do the standard discrete choice exercise. We uncover the utility parameters. We can do all kinds of counterfactuals about school design. We can say, look, we only see schools of size uh, 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 5,000 and 1,000, but I have a model in which that's just a parameter. Uh, I fit the model to the data on preferences between 5,000 and 1,000 person schools. And I infer that actually the optimal size is 25,000 for my model. I'm done. Let's redesign schools to be 25,000 big because we just solved the entire modeling problem. The only issue is who understands the true characteristics of schools? When they apply, who, who? Wow. Uh, what, are we, what, what are we thinking? And this is actually inside the mechanism design literature. You just express your preference, and your preference over what? The school. What's the school? The school is the description that the God gives it, who's just decoded the entire school, tells you everything about it, what it's good at, what it's bad at. But that's not the school as being applied to by somebody who doesn't know much. I mean, what do they think they're applying to? And uh, the trouble is, when you do this, you have forgotten something critical, which is one of the key design issues, is how do you convey useful information about what a school is. If you assume that the school is perfectly understood by default, just because that's what we assume when we're fitting models, then you have entirely lost the, could you, would you mind simplifying the description of the school? Maybe you should limit my choice to three because I get overwhelmed by a list of four million. But you can't even ask that question because it was perfectly expressed right away. So very, very worrying that, that that is the standard for modeling and thought at the moment in matching mechanisms. And they say, look, I mean, what beliefs? What are we, what, what subjective, they say we'd like to dig into the subjective beliefs, not the objective truth. What do people think they're choosing when they choose? And they have described a very nice set of studies which uh, you kind of speculate, because you don't really know, that the important things might be the likelihood of successful completion, chance to continue on to college, that schools might influence these things, and it's the, on the basis of your beliefs about their impact on these few factors that you are making your choice between them. And, that's, uh, and now, at the very least, you could start asking people, by the way, what is your belief about these things? So you've got to start d diving in. This is a survey. I don't know how else to do it right now. Because 
there's a separate thing. What happened is you had a like, which was one thing, your preferences over final characteristics. You had a belief, which was an entirely another thing, which is what do you believe the school will yield to you? And those two things got conflated in your choice. I can't possibly separate them. Uh, and that's not just a small issue. Now, they've, this has been done in various studies, but it's done in such a cottage industry that the most you can show is things like it's correlated with the truth. Like, well, of course it is. You know, I, we, we do know that uh, Bronx High School of Science is, 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 is better at science than a school that doesn't. You know, I'm, gonna be co I'm not insane, but what did people actually understand? Who knows? because it's only, the, the surveys have been done on about 20, you know, they're done on maybe 500 people. And this is it. We're, this is the most advanced thing that's being done in terms of getting at beliefs at the point of making a choice. Uh, another very interesting question. Uh, talking to the issue of who's making the choice. Justin Animansky opened that up and say, look, quite often it's very probably a combination of the child and the parent but we don't know what combination, whose preferences are being expressed. So they, you know, do a study and they find out that very often the parents are playing a very significant role. So whose preferences is this? At what point? Um, you know, yes, we've got to, uh, we, we don't even know, we've got to, we've got to design questions and it's, 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 it's going to be a real skill. This is not going to be a minor thing. And the perception reality gap is absolutely fundamental. You perceive such and such, but actually that, was, that stopped being true eight years ago. But it was true and the name, you know, it's, it keeps its name, but it's, it's a show. Uh, and I just want to point out that, you know, why am I kind of going into this? Uh, well, it turns out that the very first people to notice that you shouldn't be doing what we're currently doing in estimating discrete choice models is the people who introduced it. Block and Marshak were prior to McFadden. They introduced the random utility model. And they said, uh, our operational approach can never tell the difference. If at a pair F equals AB of, of, of desirable objects, you sometimes choose A and sometimes B, you may have difficulty in perceiving all the relevant characteristics, or you may have a you know, roughly random taste. People may have different tastes, or they may have different perceptions. And they said it's, it's hopeless, our data set is no good. They actually said, went a little further, and said, we sh when I say you recover utility, and see, so you are not discovering a rigid, counterfactual, valid utility over the school. You're discover they called it alternatives. They say, it's fine, we've discovered your preference for something called Michigan. We have no idea if you know what Michigan is. Maybe you think it's a rah-rah football school. We, we have no idea what you think it is. And so I just, I'm not going to claim that I recovered the preferences for the exact characteristics of Michigan. And I couldn't do comparative statics on Michigan's design and recover how your choices would change because I would change your, I'd have to worry, did I change your beliefs in a systematic way? They just said, get other types of data. They said it right away in 1959. Uh, Mansky's work on, on expectations measurement has really, really done this way. He said, look, I mean, we've got an identification problem. I can't tell well, what utility function you have and what subjective probabilities you have, and they're compl entirely conflated. And I'm going to have to get around that by making the assumption that you believe the truth, which is insane. I mean, that's, it's just insane. It's, it's incredible. Uh, it's not that that one by logic. Uh, Wallace and Friedman made the argument that this is a ridiculous thing to think about designing surveys because there are no incentives. Uh, but resources and teamwork overwhelmed this. So what happened is that's an a priori argument which should be ignored. It's a statement. 
Katona at Michigan would do the c consumer confidence surveys. So Michigan is the hero in all this. Uh, Tom Juster started asking probabilistic questions because he didn't find this precise enough, which by the way means Katona should be a hero too. Because Katona started pressing it, then somebody refined it, said look that's not good enough, let's get quantitative. And then it wasn't one funeral at a time, it was one HRS wave at a time that the profession crumbled and said, oh no, these are fantastic things called measuring beliefs. Uh, and Richard Sussman, Tom Juster, and Bob Willis changed the profession by saying, we're just going to go ahead in every way, we're going to measure beliefs. Uh, and now it's taking over. I, I, with Mike Woodford, I run the behavioral macroeconomics group at the MBER. About two thirds of the papers are on use of subjective belief data to replace objective reality and not note patterns in the mistakes people make. So for example, the patterns in the time series of uh, predicting asset returns, which say, tell you that that might help explain, you know, run up and, 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 and momentum in prices. So I'm just telling you, it's, it's just happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, a, in an article in which I'm trying to kind of formulate the, a vision of how you do data invention to solve identification problems, the way to review this is as a standard model space, MS, corresponding standard data, and very typically, many different models will produce the same data. The model that takes you from a model to even ideal data, infinitely obse well observed, is many to one. So you're not going to be able to find the true model just by looking at that data set. And what identification and innovation does is say, create some non-standard data, invent it. Use that so that ideally uh, there will only be one model that explains each observed non-standard data set. In particular, in this case, surveys of beliefs might actually be the belief identifier allowing you to pull out the utility function. Is, is there a sense in which the space of models is well defined? Uh, yes. I mean, in, within any model, it's absolutely very rigid. No, but I mean the space of models. So, so that one slide, I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Standard would be Bayesian expected utility maximization. Oh, okay. So, but even with that, you think that's... Oh, it's that's incredibly possible. hard. I mean, impossible. Oh, okay. This is the point is it's impossible to separate beliefs and preferences in standard behavioral data. It's not even difficult. It's just impossible. Okay. So you have to go further. And uh, Block and Marshak uh, went even further. And they said, actually, I don't want to limit myself to classical models. I'd like to expand. I'd like to say something that might be to do with group identity, say. Now, I have a non-standard model class, but that's bigger. If I only use the same behavioral data set, I'm hosed. So I have to invent data to go along with my expanded model class if I want a hope of identification. And the skill in defining this is kind of, kind of what I think is the most Im interesting thing that I know about right now. Uh, and uh, let's just ask the question, why stop at belief surveys if we want to improve schools? What would we measure if we really wanted to improve schools? And I'm just going to be very, very tedious. I said, suppose, I, suppose we could just do surveys. I mean, suppose and I'm not even, got, uh, you know, I'm assuming in the background that Hannah's been let loose and that we're filming everybody's life and the Truman Show is now <laughs> happening. <laughs> but I want to um, think about what could we get from well-informed, from interested, from conversations with interesting parties. Who knows what? And what could we dig out of them? Most people are a misunderstanding. Most people are really delighted to be asked to talk about something that they care about. And in conversation, we'll spill the beans. That's just the way it is. And survey design, when well done, is a conversation. You, and you, it's very expert. You write Dillman letters, you do cognitive testing of your questions, etc. I've spent a long time now, years, designing surveys, helping design surveys, very theoretically oriented. So we're really trying to do counterfactual answers out of the question, so we build models. The models guide the question posing. 
having posed the questions with a model in mind, you can often actually draw conclusions that are quite quantitative, which is the pleasure of it. Uh, and I tell you that I would, I, I would say there is a, a success story, which is that um, we used a classical identification problem in uh, that's very that's become very famous, which is among older Americans with wealth, there's no, very little spend down of assets. And the traditional explanation was bequest motives. But it's just been noted that there were very high health expenses. And within health expenses, we began to worry about long-term care in particular. And we thought, wait a second, how would I ever know if you're saving and keeping your wealth because you're worried about long-term care expenses for you or you're thinking about the future generation and just willing to get through to them? And uh, we basically asked very tight questions uh, designed to get inside the 60-year-old head, saying, so, okay, so let's think about contingencies. Let's ask about the contingency that you can choose you, save your money for one or the other, not both. Now, if you had to do that, your priorities would be much clearer expressed in your behavior. And when you do that, people are very clear about it, that up to quite a lot of money, they're worried about their own long-term care. That's, and boy, it's totally sensible. You arrive at a certain age, you kind of, th you think about things, and I mean, it's autobiographical. You start thinking, wow, you know, wow, that would be a nasty way to go. I didn't earn all this money to have an extremely unpleasant exit. Oh, no, we've done, we've done lots so of... So that we, people, so I, I, just a question here, is that people are aware of their motives and you just, you just need a better survey to help figure, to help distinguish them or that the survey helps people distinguish what their motives are? Uh, I, I think it's much more the former uh, I, uh, because we also kind of find out how much they, is this a topic that you have been into and been thinking about? So they're quite, this is quite a bright audience we're dealing with. Uh, and, the, you know, they've been Vanguard, the Vanguard clients. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. And, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is the Vanguard Research Initiative. I just tell you, it's an unbelievably onerous process putting these together. Um, okay. and, and nevertheless, you, you, you clearly are getting inside there. You know, thank you, you, thank you for asking. I'll tell you my priorities. And, you know, we're, and basically I think there is a contract that many parents think they have with their kids. And the contract says, I educate you and give you every chance. This is the upper middle class kind of thing. I educate you and give you every, class, every chance. Uh, maybe I keep for my care and I ask not to bother you too much at that stage, but I don't want to have a horrible time. So that, you know, that, but if, and if there's money left over, that's wonderful. Um, and we've done an amazing team and, and, and it's really, really an intensive effort to get this done. I just want to point out, and we're working now with the Danish registry, but if we wanted to design better schools, suppose that was the question. What are you doing with the Danish registry? Oh no, Danish registry, we're now developing ever more surveys and using the linked administrative data to, to do as much as you can conceivably do to design a survey to, back, to solve an identification problem that is revealed by much, much better behavioral data. We're generalizing. We've done labor behavior also. That, and the, the, the paper that that the paper that does the labor is Americans would work longer if jobs were more flexible. Okay. So we, did, we explored exactly under what circumstances would people say they would be willing to work longer. And they basically you found out that if the hours were more flexible, I'd be working longer way late in life. Yeah, that's all, that's all. yeah. And we're doing that kind of thing with Denmark now. Uh, okay, what if we... Okay, so sorry, I got to be... Um, I gotta be, I, I gotta start revealing my state of depression. Uh, suppose we actually wanted to design better schools. 
We, suppose we really wanted to. What? We design data to help design better schools. Why aren't we? Because I don't think we really care as a society. It's very depressing to me. I, if we, it's not like it's not like going to the moon. It's just like everybody goes through school. We claim we'd like to improve schools. So maybe, so there's, there's two things that I'm thinking when you say this. One is that it may be that people like their school. It's like the congressman. You like your congressman. You hate Congress. So maybe the people are somewhat happy with their schools, and they might not understand our perspective. That's I think that's where that I'll count that for not caring. Sorry, that is, by the way, there's no survey evidence that suggests that everybody thinks people are much more likely to say my school is pretty good, but all the rest of you are all crappy schools. So that's what I mean by not caring. If, if everybody thinks everybody else has got crappy schools. But then it's not about public goods generally. Yeah, I, I, it's dep I find it too, super depressing. So then another question is, is um, so better schools? So if you were to ask our audience, right, what, what good school is, we're interested in educational attainment, as test scores and grades and college and so forth. People, uh, people on the ground would, in different communities would say, no, the goal of the school is to have an education. So they're looking at civic responsibility. So it's all right. I will. I will. There's a whole group that's looking at how good the football team is and uh, did you win or not, right? So right. But for all of them, if it was their biggest concern, they would have gathered good data. So you're saying, regardless of the concern, if you whatever your concern is, and you say I really am concerned about it, I think you would set out and say, so what's the ideal data set I could gather? And the fact that that conversation hasn't happened at the social level is revealing of, I think, a priority that upsets me. Uh, what if we really cared? So let's have a massive funded effort to elicit enriched information to improve school design. First, we've got to get everything down. Like, let's get the real stuff down. This is the fact. This is what's going on. The objective knowledge that we think should go into uh, a model of a gap between knowledge and beliefs. Uh, then we're going to get in infinitely co rich data that Hannah will gather for us while Amy fires at her. Uh, then, um, of course, we'd have to ask lots of people. Ah, who have we... Who would we want to survey? Sorry, I've got to jump in here. So I, I can't figure out who's the we who's going to design these schools. So you're thinking of urban school districts. Uh, I'm not. Right? Th I'm thinking of. So let, let me just sort of push the point. So like some huge fraction of the school districts in this country are extremely small, and the way that they do these things is, you know, it's like we got five schools. It's just right. It's a there is a process for this. It's just not a technocratic process. And it's not done as if this was a scientific challenge at the massive level no, that no, you no, could pull right, data across a, yeah, a yeah. thousand different places. No, 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 that's true. Places. But my point is, it's because these are the people who control it. Yeah, right? I mean, I'm not. I, I don't, I'm going to extract the political economy and go to. So who's the we? We, the, I mean, we, us. Uh, we us. I mean, like we did a moonshot. Okay. A, okay. So, uh, I would. I just want to make a point that made me emotional even thinking about it. <laughs> was a group of people who have a lot of experience and who are never asked anything. Uh, parents. I don't know who's asked me to contribute to school design, but I've watched a lot of things happen. I went through one myself. I've seen my kids go through them. I have a lot of information. I'm so glad you asked. If somebody would ask, I would very happily share to a point of improvement. Their education as it was, what it should have been, their children's education and what it should have been, how much they felt listened to, the stupidest things they observed, the important creative things they observed, how very bad schools are at listening. Um, you know, Massive counterfactual information. We want counterfactuals. You could, I have a lot of information about what might have happened differently, what I believed then, what I believe now. The transition. Uh, I wish, what I wish I'd known then and could have. 
what those uh, you know what I value now and what I wish I'd valued less then maybe and I'm just saying this is like well but this was two seconds for me to find 20 things that I could say and that others could say all of which I think uh, would be revealing people might reveal look I mean we the, a very common illusion is the following because we found people saying I believed this and now I see differently so that could you could just uncover the systematic suggestions uh, you know solutions that worked for many um, okay I'm not optimistic this is coming uh, and I think uh, this network HGEO and INET is the kind of the the most promising thing I know because it reveals a concern from a leadership group uh, with improving the quality of education but I you know I think I don't think I'm optimistic not that that matters about this happening for all kinds of reasons but I, I believe that it, the, the, it, the issue of getting out the ideal is worth it for its own sake if just to vent thank you so um, I'm very good at figuring out trends and what's going to be important in the future so I'll tell you a little bit about myself I mean, I went to college in 1991. You graduated high school, started college in 91. Um, I remember email was just becoming a thing then. I thought that was the stupidest thing ever. It was, it was cute. It was kind of like a fun little thing. But if you really want to talk to someone, you'd pick up the phone. Why would you ever send an email? Um, I remember web browsers were just becoming a thing. But they were kind of buggy. They were cute. You know, it was a fun thing to show. But it wasn't really useful for anything. It was obviously not going to go anywhere. Um, I remember the first time I saw somebody with a cell phone who wasn't a doctor, and I thought, that's just kind of funny, right? I mean, why would you ever need a phone in your pocket? This doesn't make any sense. Um, so also going along with this, you know, I'm a traditional, uh, traditional classically trained Chicago economist from back in the day. Uh, we look at revealed behavior. Uh, we look at the pool players playing pool, and we don't ask, why are they making the shots they're making? We think, oh, they're acting like physicists, not because they're really thinking that way, but that's the simplest classical model. Um, and when I first time I saw someone using cell phone data or satellite data, I thought, you know, that's kind of cute, it's kind of clever. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to go anywhere, but it's okay, it's cute and clever that someone did that. Uh, and so, same way with someone asking for subjective beliefs. Uh, it's cute, it's clever, it's not going to go anywhere. And I'm admitting that I'm uh, not as good at predicting things as I, as I thought I was. Um, so mostly it's, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I'm not very good at predicting. Uh, let me talk briefly about the two talks we just had. Um, so the first talk, uh, the early warning system. Uh, the proposed activity is participants equipped with a smartphone, fitness tracker, collect very well, extreme wealth of data on their movements, their heart rate, their phone usage, peer network, uh, maybe collect more data like blood work and urine samples, uh, collect more data, uh, you know, uh, survey data, uh, have them take these games on the phone, use the games from, on the phone to infer how, how they're doing psychologically, um, combined with administrative data sources, there's an incredible rich collection of data, uh, then use some kind of, is a an extreme version of big data. You have you know, many, many, many uh, covariates. Uh, use lasso regression to predict outcomes. Uh, identify at-risk students, and then students who are deemed at risk. Then you target interventions as students who are deemed at risk. Um, so, trying to think through some some issues from my perspective. Um, one issue that didn't come up in the, in the talk, but was in the, in the paper, was just the word causality. So it was discussed in the paper that, oh, this is we can infer causality by doing this process. And it's, of course, a very black box prediction process. And if I see that uh, having dinner with my uh, uh, parents is a powerful predictor of I stay in school, I'm not sure that means it's, a causal, you know, it's causally causing me to stay in school. But it's, so it's a prediction problem. This is a, a causality question. Um, one other thing that was brought up is this seems like a very highly invasive monitoring. And you presume there might be some selection of who's going to agree to be part of this monitoring. That, that may or may not actually be a problem. 
in the following sense. If there's, say, 10% of kids are willing to be monitored, and you have a system of a, if you're able to accurately predict for that 10% of kids who are willing to be monitored, who will have trouble and do interventions on that 10% of, uh, that fraction of 10% of kids, you might not worry about the fact that you have a very self-selected sample. Uh, where you might worry about it, perhaps, is general, generalizability outside of the population. So if I see among the kids who are willing to be, um, have this very in, uh, intensive monitoring of them, uh, that dinner with my parents is a, high, a powerful predictor, I don't know what, if it's a powerful predictor for the other 90% of kids. Um, the stability of selection over time could possibly be an issue. And what I'm thinking here is as long as the selection into being monitored is stable over time, it's not as much of an issue. If it changes over time, either because kids realize they're being monitored and don't like it as much and change the, uh, uh, refuse to be monitored in this selective dropout uh, from the program, or, or just people's views about being monitored changes over time, uh, it becomes more of an issue. So the, the classical example of this is you know, female labor force participation and uh, labor economics. You know, not all women work. If we're trying to combine, compare the wages of women in 1950 to the wages of women in 2000, if it was the same fraction of women working in all time periods and the same selection into working, there'd be no, no problem. The problem is there's selection and it changes over time. And I would think you might have the same problem uh, here. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was stability relationship between predictors and outcomes. So a classical machine learning context is I show you, I show you, you being the, the, the algorithm, uh, a picture of a dog or a picture of a cat, and the algorithm tries to classify it as a dog or as a cat. And what's a dog and what's a cat doesn't change, right? So you, know, you show a million images of a cat and a dog, and the millionth image of a cat is not systematically different from the first image of a cat. So it's a very stable uh, problem. I would suspect that for health problems, it's also probably pretty stable. If I look at, I'm guessing, if you look at uh, blood sugar levels and heart rate and BMI and whatnot, relationship to, to diabetes, that probably isn't that different today versus yesterday. To do a very different kind of a context, you know, in finance, this is seen as a very non-stable framework, non-stable environment. And that's a big issue for machine learning kind of algorithms because the relationship between predictors and outcomes today can be very different from, from yesterday to from the day before. So within you know, finance, they spend a lot of time thinking about changes over time in, in, in the environment, of the coefficients continuously evolving over time, is regime change. So you know, massive literature looking at a lack of stability in the relationship between predictors and outcomes. And here I would wonder if it's the same kind of an issue. So for, for health, it seems very plausible to me there's a stable relationship between health aspects of me and whether I get diabetes. It's less clear to me that for these other social indicators, there's a stable relationship between these indicators and whether I drop out of school. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention, just from my you know, getting very classically trained kind of mindset, the classically tra trained kind of mindset for this kind of a problem would be to write down an explicit dynamic model and say, you know, my behavior yesterday influences my behavior today, and I have I don't know, lagged outcomes, and I don't know, write down a dynamic system, and then proceed from that. I don't, if you have enough data, maybe you can get away from all of that, right? We just, just massive prediction problem, feed it into, into Lasso, your favorite uh, algorithm. <clears throat> but I still wonder if thinking through a dynamic model could guide you in terms of what, both what data to collect and what, how to feed, translate it into regressors to then translate it, feed it into the uh, Lasso regression or, or what have you. And the final thing I wanted to mention was thinking about predicting outcomes versus predicting effects of interventions. So, you know, for example, a key thing for, say, Google or Bing and these search engines is for a long time they were using the algorithms, you know, machine learning algorithms, to predict who would click on a link. And that was the main goal. And who would click on an ad. So I, I want to predict who's going to cl click on the ad for Amazon. And someone searching for Amazon is the keyword, often clicks on Amazon, the ad for Amazon. So that's a very powerful predictor. Of course, it's obviously different from thinking about the effect uh, of the ad, right? So seeing the ad, showing the ad to people who've searched for Amazon is a powerful predictor for someone clicking on the ad and going to Amazon. It doesn't mean that it's a causal thing or the effect of 
be shown the ad is high uh, uh, for those individuals. So here, it makes perfect sense. You're trying to predict who's at risk and target interventions for those who are at risk. That's clearly related to who's going to benefit from the intervention. Presumably, people who are at risk will benefit from intervention. Someone who's at zero risk will not benefit from an intervention. But it's still not quite the same thing. And, and you might change how you're thinking a little bit um, to shift from who's at risk to who will most benefit from, from the intervention. And just the connected different literatures I just mentioned, the sample selection literature, uh, time series literature is used, say, in finance, uh, and the treatment effect uh, kind of a literature. Um, and going a little bit more through, the, through Andy's talk, I don't have any deep thing to say whatsoever. Um, so again, a, tr a traditional mindset, and so the way I was uh, trained, is you take the data as given. The data is typically designed for descriptive purposes. You know, we want to ask people their wages because we want to know what's average wage or has wage changed over time. So the data, the survey is probably designed for descriptive purposes. Uh, I just take it as given. I have a model. I'm going to pose enough assumptions such that I can identify the parameters of my model uh, given my assumptions and the data is given. And I'm going to tinker with how general my model is to make it fit, maybe make it, make it identify. So um, I do often impose that agents are rational uh, agents and they have expectations that are right on average and they're rational expectations and they do things if expected benefit exceeds expected cost and expected benefit uh, is, is on average correct. Um, and I, why do I do that? It's because I make things identified. And if I get too far away from that, there's too many moving parts, things are not identified, and uh, all hell breaks loose. A more recent mindset, which is something Chuck Mansky has been pushing for a long time, um, is basically the same idea, but just not insist on point identification. You allow, I can't necessarily determine exactly which model is right, but there's some class of models that are consistent with the data. Um, they'll still take the data as given and, and not being constructed. And this new mindset, it was wonderful. I mean, I really like it. So I, I don't have any deep insights other than this. I, I really like it. Um, I'm going to mention briefly my own work. Uh, this also just kind of leads to me to what, what I'm interested in and confused by and want to think more about. But again, I'm, I'm an outsider and I'm trying to catch up. Um, so just to briefly mention my previous work, I have a, a long-standing literature with Jim Hackman trying to look at the effects of, of, of treatment, what's the effect of going to school on wages or the effect of taking the medicine on, on health. I, a key aspect of what we do is try to study the connection between desire for treatment and the effect of treatment. Uh, is it the case those, those people who most want to go to college benefit the most? Are those individuals who least want to go to college those who would benefit the least from going to college? Uh, are things targeted correctly? Um, are, are kids placed into foster care the ones who are most helped by foster care and, and, and so forth. So the connection between most desire something or, or the administrator most desire something uh, and the effect, trying to understand that connection. And we did that presuming a standard observational data set, uh, presuming you have an instrument, but not any kind of data engineering and not any kind of unusual uh, uh, questions. Um, of course, the key issue for us is the desire for treatment is completely unobserved. I look at my data set, I see, you know, Ed went to college and Joe didn't. There's no question about, you know, did Ed really want to go to college or not, or how much did he desire it? Um, the end approach, which, you know, I really like, and it's what my uh, career is mostly based upon, um, has some issues. One issue is super data uh, hungry. Uh, it ends up involving fitting a non parametric Condition expectation point wise and derivative of that expectation point wise, which is really, really hard to, to estimate precisely. Uh, so you need you know, a massive data set to make it really operational. And, and then that is a limitation of, of my ability to think things through or Jim's ability. But just if you have this kind of data and you think this kind of model is reasonable, you need lots and lots and lots of data. So a recent paper, um, a relatively recent, that I really liked that got me thinking that maybe I'm not thinking about this quite correctly. Uh, there was a paper by uh, Barry et al. looking at the effect of a water filter on later uh, uh, diarrhea. And they asked people, how much do you value the water filter? 
And now in particular, they call it willingness to pay, but willingness to pay is, of course, how much you value the water filter. Um, in this particular literature, they don't trust people to say how much they value the water filter. They do this second price auction kind of a mechanism such that if people are perfectly rational, it's in their interest to tell you how much they value the water filter if they understand the game and have thought through that their optimal strategy is to say the correct price. Uh, and combining with randomization of price of treatment, they do everything that Hackman and I did more plausibly and actually other than needing this special kind of data under much weaker requirements of data. You can have a much, much smaller sample size um, and proceed compared to what I did with Jim. I think that's kind of wonderful. Obviously, the, the, one of the main worries is that agents are going to lie about how much you value the water filter. Uh, they're willing to believe that agents can figure out that the optimal strategy to this game is to state the true preference. And given that combination, they do this, this BDM mechanism. And there's a related uh, literature, you know, selective trials, which is, has a similar flavor, right? So they assume that the agents in the experiment are rational, the, 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 they can figure out the optimal response to different incentives, and given how they optimally respond to different incentives, you can infer uh, the, the cost of effort or other, other uh, attributes of the agents. So something I'm currently doing, uh, I've never done anything with experiments ever before. Uh, I'm getting my toes wet. Uh, I'm trying to do something with some, a former student in Singapore, uh, which is very much along this line where we're, we're trying to figure out response to compensation schemes, like a winner-take-all tournament versus a piece rate. Uh, how do you respond to those two different kind of uh, compensation schemes? Which one do you select into? The connection between desire for a particular compensation scheme and how will you perform under the different incentive schemes combined with a BDM kind of mechanism. I, and again, I've always been thinking, I don't ask them, do you think you'll do well or do you think you'll win the tournament? Uh, I assume they're being rational. I put down a simple model, assume rationality on their part. Um, get the, do a mechanism such that their optimal response is to tell me how well they will think they'll do um, uh, in this BDM kind of way, uh, and then proceed. So that, that's honestly is, is what I'm doing. And I'm being dragged kicking and screaming towards uh, uh, this new, new data idea. Um, and I guess one question I have, and this, this, this is an honest question, it's an honest question of someone who's new to all of this, is the idea of eliciting beliefs or, 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 or preferences versus some mechanism to, to enrich the scope of what you would do under alternative options combined with some modeling to back out indirectly what the beliefs and preferences would be that would rationalize that, those series of choices. So obviously school- You're right, you're right yeah. on the front end. Physical issue, well, how would that impact? And it had a nice match. 
Levin, Mansky, and, and others have been exploring belief measurement and its consonance with reality, Michael mm -hmm. Hearn and Suzanne Rowe. And, and it's uh, generally so far a mild success story. Uh, the things that we, I've done, are tended to be look, I'm going to give you a decision problem that's artificial. I'm going to ask you a very idealized decision problem. And I'm going to ask you to give an answer. Again, all the evidence is you're giving me a coherent story. So we ask you know, five ways, and you get the same thing out of them from four, you know, from the most angle. But then you're also beginning to know that it's conceivable that the two in combination are much better. And what we're doing, what I want to do, what the next step is in Denmark, is having posed a question about what will you do if to make sure that the if comes true. In other words, if you know a reform is coming, you can pose a survey question beforehand about, look, we suppose the following three possible futures are in front of you. Please tell us what you'll do in these three futures. Which is very much like yeah. the um, kind of an idea. Yeah, and, and if it turns out we've done this before the actual implemented change, then you have a spectacular ability to see the scientific content of that response. And then you might say, look, at now I'd like to measure survey response error. And I think what you one thing you'll find is that there are people who aren't really listening to the scheme you and the question you describe, and you'd love to be able to separate them out because they're just going to mess the whole thing up for you. Like, oh, I didn't really understand your question, so I can answer the random, but I'm hidden in all the other answers. So, how, so could, I, could I, in fact, and they do this now in some surveys, they put in track questions, and they decide if you're, in, if you're attentive or not, and they X out the answers from the people that are inattentive. That has bias too. So now there's a discussion, you know, we're really on the forefront of, so how do you do this to elicit strong information out of these answers. Do you, you like that? So. So I, uh, can I just say that I, I'm just really puzzled by this world that we think that people are thinking through all of this stuff. We are. Maybe the vanguard investors are. But um, to what extent are people able to really, you know, to really think through what they would do in their contingency. Some people don't even know what interest rate is. And, uh, you know, that... that <laughs> so, I, I, no, this is a real question. Sure. Yeah, so... Um, and there's also this literature out there that's made me think of this, I think when you were saying one of these, one of these things here, I forget which point, bullet point, but made me think of this literature. This is by Dan Gilbert. Do you know this stuff by Dan Gilbert? I know some of it. Which is basically the idea, so you think you'll be miserable and happens and you'll think you really want why, but then when X actually happens, you know what? It was the best thing that ever happened to me that I actually, you know, lost my job. I would, you know, so people adapt to whatever circumstance it is. So Dan Gilbert has all of this work on that you, you sort of, uh, people are adaptive to their circumstances and happiness is some sort of constant over life and happy people are happy on people around. It's a little bit like that. I'm not doing justice to the work. But, but I think you are. But, okay. So, it, so it, it has a lot of loosey-goosey stuff to it, but there is this phenomenon, and you see it all the time, that people want X, they don't want Y, Y happens, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. People adapt to their circumstances. So 
can sit here and answer it and say, look, I, I don't think they know what they're doing. Like, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe that's very interesting. Maybe there are places where they're not ready with a counterfactual or that their counterfactual is lousy. Maybe that's extremely important for understanding their behavioral response. Because it's everything that's a surprise to them. Like, oh, I don't know. It happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this school choice thing now is really, uh, it gets really deep and I think it's fairly important. Um, I, I would have thought about this as being really just relevant to the big cities, which is a huge fraction of the population. But because we are using systems that, uh, you know, I think people don't understand well. And the really good thing about these systems is that they're strategy proof, right? That's it. The way we allocate schools, that's it. They're strategy proof. Not welfare maximizing, not no performance map. I mean, look, I, Another, I, I, it's, it's really a stunning thing. And yeah, you're saying yeah. we might have a different criteria. Our criteria might be to be a school choice mechanism that would lead to comprehension. The best uh, yeah. education outcomes. Yeah. And the only circumstances in which the strategy proof thing leads to something like that is with extremely high levels of information. Yeah. So that's self reflection. So not only so that you can include that information. Yeah, in right. So I would actually uh, add to one of these, you know, the, the standard information about the school will also be about your own child, and how your child will do well in that. I, last year I was at a, a thing with the New Orleans, I don't know, charter school people. And one of the issues they have there is that every charter school has its own bus transportation system. And then you end up with these kids applying to schools and they're traveling very long distances. And, uh, and, and they, they don't know. Like the kids don't actually understand this. And so a new thing they're doing, in part I think from our conversation, is that when on the applications, when they're going to they are going to give the parents the information about predicted travel time to school. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if that happened or not, but that would be like a, that. That was the conversation. That would be a step in your direction. Yeah, right? I think we're that would be I'm, fantastic. We're right? currently at the stage of uh, uh, it's yes. all good because Apple. Uh, we also, we have all read and understood the Apple warranty every time. Every time that this comes out, yeah. there's a 400 page document. It's called, it's called informed consent. But there's a, but there really is an interesting question there on the sort of the school design, school design yeah. preference revelation. Yeah. If you know, so what if, for example, they change the way that we do uh, admissions for our selective high schools, which you know is a big deal in the city? What, well, you know, do the people who would go who are far below what the standard would be, do they have any, you know? Any information about what previous people, what's the probability they succeed? Awesome stuff. Hannah and I, we have to move us on to lunch.